Welcome to Pomo Arts. Tonight, we are streaming live for a virtual artist talk with Susie Burstein for her exhibition, When I Have Wings to Fly. I'm Janice Cotter, gallery manager. I would like to begin the evening by acknowledging that we are gathered on the shared, unceded, ancestral, and traditional lands of the Coast Salish people, including the Tsleil-Waututh, Kwikwetlam, Squamish, Musqueam, Kepsi, Kekot, and Stolo Nations. As a small first step in the process of reconciliation, we make this acknowledgement to recognize, honor, and offer our gratitude for their enduring connection to and care for these lands, mountains, and waters. Our presence here is the result of a colonial legacy that is still unfolding in harmful ways. A land acknowledgement is just one small step towards a larger effort at reconciliation. As we gather virtually in Port, Moody, Port Moody's Old City Hall, our very own colonial seat of power to celebrate and make art, we think it's the perfect opportunity to reflect deeply. We invite you to join us in carrying forward these reflections into meaningful reconciliation efforts and to hold us accountable for doing the same. Now I'd like to thank Pomo Arts Board of Directors, as well as our longtime supporters, the City of Port Moody, the Province of British Columbia for their support through the gaming, Community Gaming Program, the Government of Canada for their support through the Canada Summer Jobs Program. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, it's such a pleasure to have the multi-talented Susie Burstein with us tonight and to have her exhibition in the gallery. It's been a long road from our first uh, 2019 conversations about having an exhibition at Pomo Arts to having this show in, in our gallery space. Of course, Susie is such a bundle of creative energy. And in addition to preparing work for this exhibition, she's continued to teach at Arts Umbrella on Granville Island and make work for other shows and participate in other exhibitions as well. She is a ceramic sculptor, a potter, a painter, a dancer, a, a performer, and an educator who's also an Emily Carr at our University of Art and Design graduate. She is inspired visually and spiritually by contemporary and ancient cultures. When I Have Wings to Fly was inspired by the life and art of Frida Kahlo, merged with the intersecting influences from Susie's personal experiences and memories of her mother's life. She views Frida as a symbol of empowerment and strength, a person who takes something that is tragic and transcends and transforms it through her notion of beauty. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to welcome Susie Burstein here this evening. Hello, Susie. It's so great to have mm -hmm. you here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for inviting me to do this and for inviting me to have this my show. Thank you. Well, I'm glad that it finally uh, worked out because it definitely was something that was uh, um, up in the air for a long time with the pandemic and so many other things happening. So I'm glad that it's worked out. I'm just um, getting your video ready here, trying to uh, close this um, graphic that I've got. And <laughs> is, of course, wanting to, uh, want, not wanting to participate or <laughs> cooperate. There we go. Okay. And now what I'm going to do. Um, so we, when you, be, when we first installed the show, um, you came down and we walked through the exhibition and our uh, marketing coordinator, Star Horn, recorded video of you talking um, about all the work. That's right. It was very exciting. There's a lot of stuff to talk about. Well, and, and, and it's nice that since we can't do an in-person artist talk, at least we're able to have you 
walk through the gallery and show wonderful. people the show. Well, it's been quite wonderful because we also had a live opening. So people and people are able to actually see the work. And then I think one of the, um, is there an upside to the pandemic? One of the upsides is that people became very savvy about how to do things virtually. And it's so beneficial to have both. And it's, it's wonderful that you're doing both. I really appreciate it. Well, I'm excited that you were able <laughs> to, to do the video and to be here this evening because I don't know if you want to tell people, but you're actually preparing to go to another opening reception for an exhibition <laughs> you're in as soon as this ends. <laughs> so I am right now, we're recording this from uh, the Italian Cultural Center, and I'm in a show called Luminescence that Angela Clark, the curator, has put together, has curated. And I'm in the office at the ICC, and you can see behind me Sophia Loren, and Marcella Mastriani. So I am in very good company here. I'm very, they're like my talisman. It's really awesome. <laughs> and so after, after all of this, I will be going to this opening. Yes, people are arriving oh, for the opening. Yeah. That's great. So <laughs> right now I am going to um, share the video of your uh, artist talk. And that's then... After the um, artist talk, we will come back and Susie will answer any of your questions about the show. And I have uh, some questions here as well that we had uh, were curious about my gallery <laughs> assistants and I. And uh, but please post your comments in the uh, video or in the chat of the Facebook uh of the Facebook event, and we will ask your, your questions as well, and Susie will answer them. So Thank here you. we go on the video, and we will be back in about 27 minutes. Hi, I'm Susie Burstein and I'm so happy that you're joining me for my artist talk this evening about my current solo exhibit at Poma Arts called When I Have Wings to Fly. If you want to come with me, fly through. Come on. This piece is called This Is How Life Is. And it's one of my first Frida pieces for this show. And uh, she's painted very blue. I actually thought I'd be very monochromatic in this show. And each piece would have a color that was symbolic of the piece. So this one stayed blue. Um, it is representative of, of blue as spirituality, but also blue as in having the blues sometimes. And it is after a painting of hers that I love called Broken Column, which has a, a kind of an ancient Greek column as her spine and it's broken and bleeding. And um, in my piece, I, uh, I gave her that same column, but then I extended it. I often do headdresses and I extended it into a um, kind of more pristine column that's actually um, a vertebrae from a Mexican folk art piece. And this figure here is taken from one of Frida's drawings in her journal that is called I Am Disintegration, which is so sad. And, um, but in my piece, even though she has this kind of broken leg that is actually coming from a broken deer's leg that I had, um, she's more like she's dancing on top of a healthy column. And that's more the way I wanted to see her. This piece is sitting on top of a book, and the book is a catalog from a show at the Victoria Albright Museum that was um, about Frida and uh, the uncovering of her artifacts, like her clothing and her makeup and uh, the things that she needed to make her body work and function. And it's called Frida Kahlo, Making Herself Up, which is such an interesting title for a show and um, and and so interesting in terms of talking about makeup. So part of this piece, I have um, uh, put this lipstick, which was actually my mother's lipstick. 
and it's Revlon lipstick, which is actually the same lipstick brand as Frida Kahlo wore, as I found out when reading this book. And I took my mother's color off and I made a uh, ceramic red lipstick in the color that Frida would wear. And it's the beginning of my realizing with this show that um, if there were, I wouldn't want to say exactly gaps in, in my creation or my ideas, but there was a, an evolution that happened with my ideas and why I was making Frida. And it, it started to come together that this show of Frida had to do also with an honoring of, of my mother and of um, how Frida, who is someone who we know suffered terribly from polio as a child and later from a terrible trolley accident that uh, speared right through her pelvic area and you know broke her back and caused her physical pain and many, many, many operations over the years. She still managed somehow with her, her resilience, her talent, her drive, her creativity to make art, to turn it into something of beauty. And she also turned her whole life into something of beauty and herself as something of beauty. It made me reflect upon my mother who had other kinds of issues in her life that, and she found so difficult to turn it into a life of beauty. But sometimes she did, and one way was her lipstick. This piece is called With Wings to Fly. And, um, you know, birds to me are a very symbolic kind of thing. My Hebrew name is Sephora, and that means bird. And um, I think of birds as freedom and flight and travel and escape and flights of fancy. And then during COVID, Birds became another thing. Birds became something where you're nesting and you're, uh, you're home and you're thinking about all the things that, that have transpired in your life that when you were out there flying and now you're bringing them home and you're nurturing. And um, in this piece with Frida, who also loved birds, she had a wonderful painting with four parrots. So it's referencing the four parrots. So I have four different birds on this piece, but in, in my piece, the birds start to become her body. They, they're like her arms, they're like her flight, but it's not like the wings, it's like the birds themselves are like her shoulders and into flight. And yet, and yet in that, she's very contemplative and there's a kind of sadness in there, but you know, she's surrounding herself with roses. And uh, again, this reference to my mother, and I thought, um, I saw my mother's Royal Dalton piece, and I thought that would just be a beautiful thing to have in her headdress and kind of conjoin my feelings towards it together. Upon a bed of blue roses, we embrace this piece. This piece actually started out a while back as a Madonna piece, and I couldn't come up with the baby that I wanted to have for her. She's been sitting in my studio, and there's a painting by Frida, and it's called The Love Embrace of the Universe, the Earth, brackets Mexico, Diego, me, and Senor Chotel from 1949. And basically, it shows that. It shows the universe. It shows the earth. It's got nature, and there's a woman embracing Frida, and then there's Frida, and Frida is embracing Diego, and Diego is like a baby with a Diego grown-up face. <laughs> and when you read Frida's diaries, you know, she refers to him as my child, my husband, my lover, my this, my that, right? He's like everything to her. And I thought, well, this piece, this is the piece that I would use to express that, that Frida piece. And so, like, nestled on your breast, we've got Frida holding Diego and it is all about embrace and love and love of nature and love of the universe and making the world a better place and appreciating where we are. This blue tree at the top is just sort of symbolic again of like spirituality and coming out of the head but it's got gold and again it's it's just kind of regal and mystical and, and beautiful and represents the universe. This piece is called Armored Amour, 
Um, I would say that this one is uh, the one that kind of looks the most like Frida Kahlo to me. And I made it while I was reading her journal. And I, I, I love how Frida dresses. And I also love to play dress up. And Frida always played, played dress up. And I'll use that word play because it's a playful act. Uh, as well as a sort of symbolic act. And in this piece, I have Frida basically wearing pages of her journal. So I just kind of uh, was inspired by Im images that were in her journal, and I used that to paint the dress. And I also took a quote from the journal, which is, I hand you my universe, and you live in me. And that, of course, is dedicated to Diego and her great love for Diego. Um, this is another another part where um, there's a connection between Frida Kahlo, myself, and my mother. And it's actually through the act of writing and through journaling. So my mother, she, she was a journalist. And um, I have always kept a journal since I've been about 10 years old. Frida Kahlo wrote a journal in the last 10 years of her life. And uh, what it made me think about... Is, um, is the choices that we make or that we don't know we can make. And in the case of Frida, uh, uh, she was in that terrible accident which prevented her from having children. And this was a huge thing because she really wanted to have Diego's babies. And she did uh, follow an incredible life of art and had an incredible life. My mother was a journalist in the, um, the late 40s and when the men came back from the war, Women were not to be having those jobs, and so men got her job. And it kind of coordinated with um, falling in love with my father and thinking that she had to make a choice between pursuing a career or, or being a parent and, and having a, a family life. So she chose that. And I think the thing that's really incredible and wonderful about the time that I'm born in, and something that my mother actually would say to me, is I had a choice to have both. And that's a real blessing. So the piece is titled Armored Amour. And I think of that title for a number of my pieces. And I kind of think about it for myself. And what that is, is that you um, you have a, a spirit and a feeling of love, amour, inside of you. And you need to protect that. And there's a certain sense of armor that protects that. Some people protect that by toughening their skin and getting harder. But other people... I think myself, I think Frida, I think my mother, have a sort of protective skin that is about having fun playing dress up. That's what it's about. You know, so in this in this piece, and projecting that kind of fun, actually, projecting that. And in this piece, I have taken parts of Frida's journal um, and played around with them. And so she's actually dressed in her journal. She's dressed in her drawings on her clothing. Um, something I would like to say as a thank you to the curator, Janice Cotter, is that I brought in the books, but she made the selections. And this yellow book with the yellow in her dress, and excuse me, and the title, Self-Portrait in a Velvet Dress, which is all about Frida's wardrobe, completely suits Armour and more. The music of the universe surrounds us, and this piece is after a painting that Frida did called Self-Portrait with Braid. So she has, in that painting, her hair is tangled and it's kind of flying about, and there's butterflies on her shoulder, and there's some birds, and there's sort of some flowers, but there's like a sort of like a frantic sort of sense to the original painting. In my piece, <clears throat> I have created these spiky sort of um, butterflies in black metal. And upon her head, in her headdress, is a Day of the Dead skeleton who's playing the harp. And he's got the same butterflies in his head as she has on her body. And the thing about the Day of the Dead, and I've always loved this about, about Mexico since my first trip to Mexico and learning about Frida, is that it is about making friends with death. It's about acknowledging death. And um, it has a real sense of humor to it, which Frida also had. And it's something that's really different than what we have in our culture. In this piece, 
Frida is wearing a Hamsa earring, his hand, which I just happen to have. And Frida has it in her painting. It was a white Hamsa handmade by Picasso, an earring for her that he gave to her. The Hamsa is a symbol of, of protection and spirituality. And I think, you know, Frida to me is, is what I call a spirit mentor. And actually so is Picasso. And this is a moment where the two of them, my two, my, they're not really my, but my two spirit mentors are in harmony with each other. And this piece just kind of talks about that in a subtle way. This piece is actually I know I shouldn't say this in this, but it is actually one of my favorite pieces. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it's called Outside Time, The Magic. Uh, it refers to Frida's painting, The Wounded Deer, also one of my favorite paintings. But um, this piece is constructed with clay, and it was a face that actually uh, related more to my travels to Greece and to Mexico, that kind of a classic. Greek face when it was white and just at the beginning of making it. The deer in this piece is a paper mache piece. It's a folk art piece from Mexico and actually from Coyoacan. It's from a time that I went to Coyoacan about 20 years ago uh, with a wonderful dancer. It was a very creative experience and uh, I was at Frida Kahlo's house once again. There was a fellow across the street and he was an artist and he created a number of these paper mache folk art pieces, which I bought the table of them. Many of them broke over the years. It reminded me of Frida's dear piece and of her head that was her own face that she puts on top of that deer. And so I made a sort of Frida face and I took the deer face and I'm using it as an amulet around her neck. Frida loved her animals. She loved wild animals that she would, that I guess were kind of tame around her. She was kind of like a tamed wild animal herself. How I structured this piece is that in the, in the original painting, there are arrows in the deer's body and from the arrows there's blood. You know, you have a real sense of Frida's pain. Um, but, you know, Frida also uh, um, transcended that pain, as we all hope to be able to do. And in my piece, this head is attached with nails. The nails are actually a structure in the neck, in the back of the piece, and form a sort of collar around the deer's face, which makes it an entirely different kind of piece. As with Frida's painting, I replaced the deer's head with her own for the headdress of this sculpture. However, rather than the nails piercing the deer's body that signifies her suffering, they reinforce the ceramic head to the papier mache body, emphasizing Frida's strength. I mirror this relationship by having Frida wear one of my repurposed deer heads as an amulet. Frida had pet deer in her life, and to her they symbolize herself as simultaneously wounded and empowered to express her deepest, most authentic self. Hence, I'm going with myself. As a reference to my medium, the deer on the front of Frida's dress has kiln cones in place of arrows. Kiln cones are used by ceramic artists to indicate the temperature of the kiln and to automatically shut off the kiln. So they have a kind of power. The golden paintbrush is in place of her arm. This is a symbol for me of the disintegration of Frida's body throughout her life, but the regrowth of it through her art. This piece is called Taming the Wild, Nestled to a Rose. Frida herself was pretty wild and she was nestled to a rose. In this case, she had, it's from this beautiful painting, one of my favorite paintings of Frida with a necklace of thorns and a hummingbird and there's blood around her neck. And on one shoulder is a cat and on the other shoulder is her monkey, both of which were pets of hers, along with deer and parrots and other wonderful animals, wild animals from nature. So I've repositioned those animals. And instead of having thorns in her neck and the hummingbird, 
I have a bird on the top of her head that's ready for flight or it's nesting on her head. It's definitely a content kind of a bird. On her shoulder is her monkey. This is my version of Frida's monkey. And the monkey is dressed very similarly to Frida. It's kind of like, it's not like a monkey that used to get dressed up in the old days with the old organ grinders, but it's like, it's like their companion spirits and he's almost like her child. And uh, the cat that she has, and I do have cats, but the cat that she has has turned into a sphinx. So it's the sphinx that's nestled into the rose. And for me, the sphinx is a symbol of protection and love and wisdom and the power of the feminine spirit. With all these pets, these wild kinds of animals that were somewhat domesticated, I think that they uh, became like Frida's children and the children that she was unable to have. So it, the piece kind of represents taming the wild and Frida, of course, is an example of this. This, this piece is called Mi Diego, Ya No Estoy Sola, which means, my Diego, I am no longer alone. And it's a quote in her journal. It's um, the actual pieces after a painting of Frida's that's called Diego in my thoughts, where she has Diego painted into her forehead. There's tears on her cheeks and she's dressed as a Tijuana. Um, the crown of thorns on her head, the tears on her cheeks, Diego embedded in her forehead, reference a time of infidelity, infinite love, self-sacrifice, and spirituality. In the good times, Frida dressed and painted herself as a Tijuana, which pleased Diego. It also pleased her, as Tijuanas are an icon or iconic of an ancient Mexican matriarchal society. And wearing this magnificent clothing would have been very empowering. The back of the sculpture is inspired by Frida's drawings and writings in her journal, where she merges herself and Diego as one, even when they're torn apart. The journal, in my opinion, is in fact one long love poem to Diego, and hence the title, Mi Diego, Ya no estoy sola, my Diego, I am no longer alone. This piece is called, She Was Like a Walking Flower, Centered by a Rod of Steel. And Frida was like a walking flower. Her hair was always strewn with flowers. Her embroidery on her clothing had flowers. She had a beautiful garden with flowers, flowers in the house. The Rod of Steel references her broken spine, but spiritually and kind of physically and how she got through life, it was like a rod of steel. In fact, she did have steel in her body. And, um, and I actually uh, thought of that quote because it is referencing something that someone has said about me, about how, um, <laughs> how I might look really cute, etc. but actually I am like a rod of steel, like, you know, there's that strength and empowerment and, I guess, intelligence that goes uh, beyond what the physical might look like. And at the top of this rod of steel, there is a bird, which we all know what I think about birds, but that bird is carrying a pillbox, and that pillbox is actually my mother's pillbox. And in Frida's possessions that were found and shown in the museum uh, called uh, for the show Making Myself Up, it, she had a similar kind of pillbox, and I just thought that was the most amazing kind of thing. So in 2018, the Victoria and Albert Museum curated an exhibit titled Frida Kahlo, Making Herself Up, displaying an intimate collection of Frida's clothing, jewelry, makeup, and prosthetics. Diego Rivera, her husband, as we know, an artist, had specified that this treasure trove of objects not be opened until 50 years after Frida's death. Nicholas Murray's photographs of Frida Kahlo solidify her image at the height of her career and act as an entry point into the objects of her home and her studio and her career. Seeing Frida's treasured things, similar to those my mother left me, led me to incorporate my mother's treasures into my sculptures. In this piece, Once Upon a Treble Clef, on the top of that treble clef rests my mother's La Vie est Belle perfume bottle. 
The metal rod or treble clef represents the brace that supports Frida's broken spine due to her trolley accident. Mr. Schotel, Frida's hairless dog, nestles within her braids with her paintbrush. Her dog signifies Frida's love for companionship with animals to ease her despair at not being able to bear children. I've always identified with Frida and how she uses personal and artistic endeavors to transcend her pain into beauty. Um, I've included in this show uh, pieces from the Sephora series. Sephora series are self-portraits, loosely self-portraits of myself, and Sephora means bird. In this case, to sail like a swan, she has a swan on her head that is referencing uh, Salvador Dali swans in his paintings and also his taxidermy swans that he had in his home. And she has, as do all these pieces because they happen during COVID, she is pregnant, pregnant with life. And uh, to me during COVID, it was about nesting and it was about creating symbols of beauty and a pregnant body was something that is so beautiful. Then I made uh, paintings uh, that are portraits of these portraits, such as the one over here that's called Apsara Mirage. How this, this piece is two different Sephora pieces. It's this one, to sail like a swan, and it's another one that is a sunflower piece that's after Van Gogh, that one over there. And what is personal to me about this painting and makes it a self portrait kind of piece is that this piece on the right hand side with this one in your head and this pregnant belly this is actually this is actually my grandson in utero <laughs> that when I made this piece and started this series I did not know that my son's wife was having a baby and somehow this is what I was creating sculptures of and She's got, and this baby is born in Cambodia. It's the eastern part of the world. But on her head is this western image from Dali of the swan. The piece on the left actually represents my other, um, my other daughter-in-law. And uh, she has on her head a sort of temple-like piece that's sort of like Southeast Asian temples. And this kind of, you know, exotic animal on your head. So in, in fact, what they have done is uh, taken on East, West, and combined those kinds of cultures together in this new family. And that is part of a portrait of my life. There are a number of paintings in this show that reference the Sephora series, but they also reference Frida, and that's why they're in this show. Uh, the show of Frida, there are images of Frida but underlying that is her love for Diego. And in my show of Sephora, there's images of women, but underlying it is also my relationship with my family and my husband. And this particular painting, which is called Till There Was You, it's after um, Egon Schiele's painting. And he looks like a groom, right? He even has a piece of glass for his wedding ring. And he looks a lot looks a lot like my husband when we got married. I want to thank you so much for coming to see my show, When I Have Wings to Fly. I hope you enjoy the work, the talk, the readings, and thank you. Um, so I do, I have some questions that, uh, 
that we wanted to ask you. And um, one of them is uh, the theme of journaling in the diary of Frida Kahlo mm -hmm. seem essential to your development of this exhibition. How do you decide what journal passages to choose for creating your Frida sculptures? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> we can thank Emily for that one. <laughs> oh, Emily, thanks a lot. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> I don't know, I guess uh, the journaling part, you know, it evolved as I was making the sculptures and towards the end of making the sculptures, like while I was painting the sculptures. So, um, and I was thinking more and more about all the symbolism that was happening in my work and, and how I was using these pieces from my mother and incorporating things from my travels and stuff like that. And then I guess I just kept looking at, you know, there's the English translation part at the end of the journal and I would just be reading and looking at these words all the time and I would just see what seemed to resonate with my piece. That's that's how it is. It's just what turns up when I'm looking at both. When I look at both at the same time, what is it that comes together that makes sense? And I might have, and it's the same for titles, I might have a series of like just words that I like, phrases that I like, or parts of stories in the journal that I like. And then I know what the pieces are that I have to deal with. And I just see what resonates. And that's how it happens takes a long time uh, yes I'm sure mm -hmm. and and reflecting and going back and um, mm -hmm. getting a visual for those um, passages um, the visual already exists so the passages happen after right okay. but it has but they have to fit together yes yes yeah um so now another thing that uh, we actually had uh, someone come into the gallery a couple of days ago and wanted to know about your color and your glazing and um, if you are, you know, your, your method of glazing and under glaze and are you using um, additional mediums on top of that? So do you want to speak to that? Sure. So um, the Sephora pieces, of which you have three, are all, um, they are using fired materials. So they, I do use under glazes with a white glaze or a clear glaze on top and, um, and lusters, gold luster, mother of pearl luster, and some other lusters. And they would not have any other surfaces on top of them unless there's maybe a touch of gold leaf but no cold surfaces because it's a shiny surface and you can't really adhere the paint the way I would want it to be on top of that. The, the pieces um, uh, in this show that are the Frida pieces do not have glaze. I started out by doing under glazes and I realized it would just take too many firings, too much, uh, you know, it just seemed like I would use oil paint. That's what Frida used. And, um, and and on her work, and this work is about a painter, and I could get the colors that I wanted, and I could have a different experience. Mostly, that's what it is for me when I change materials: is I need a different experience. And then, how would I best express that? So, oil paint, oil sticks, uh, gold leaf. Um, oh, uh, cold wax mixed with oil sticks. Cold wax mixed with the paint sometimes. Cold wax sometimes just on top to give a different surface on top of the paint. I use all those things. Okay, that's uh, uh, that's taking quite a uh, uh, different approach to the finishing on the on the ceramic sculpture. Very very different. And some of the Sephora pieces that were from pre COVID, they looked more like aging buildings. And on those, I used. Um, I used oxides that were wiped off and then oxides on top and then under glazes on top. And some areas would have clear glaze or white. So it had all those things and gold leaf. And then if I still wasn't happy, I would do oil paint on top of the parts that were, um, that were not with any shiny glaze on it. I'd use and, and cold wax and yeah, <laughs> they have a wow. lot of different things. Yeah. Um, Dorothy Doherty is asking, um, I'm interested to know if all the colors on your sculpture, oh, this is, 
a similar question. I missed this before. Are ceramic and fired or did you use oil and acrylic paint on the sculptures? You have a wonderful range of colors on these sculptures. So I guess that's pretty much the question. I'm sorry, Dorothy, I didn't see your question when I was asking um, Susie. Uh, I'll just say no, no acrylics, no acrylics, no acrylics, no acrylics, just the oil, uh, cold wax, oil glazes, stick. under glazes, yeah. gold leaf. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And Rose Caps um, said, uh, she says, I was told you created these sculptures in a short time. Is that so? <laughs> I don't know. I guess it depends what you call a short time. Yeah. I started them in September. I finished making them. So there's 12 of them I, or 11, I think. I finished making them in February, maybe. And then I was painting them from February throughout May. Okay. So I don't know if that's faster. I didn't get paintings done that I wanted to do specifically for the free to show. So yeah. I'd say it's slow. <laughs> I don't know. Um, Jillian McMillan had commented that um, she remembered those pregnant women appearing and wasn't surprised when you told us grandparenthood was happening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I didn't know that when I started that series. No. I did not know that. Yeah. No. And she also um, enjoys the enthusiastic descriptions of your pieces. So. Thank you, Jillian. <laughs> Thank you. It's the most, it's the most descriptive I've ever been. It's the most I've ever put into words. This show. Yeah. Wow. I, I think, I think as I, I think it made sense because my mother had come into it and because of my mother's writing and because of Frida's writing. And then I thought I write in a journal all the time, but I don't ever really talk about all this stuff. Wow. And I decided mm -hmm. to do that and put it into words and put it out there. Yeah. And we included um, each of the sort of story descriptions, inspirations that you had for each piece. We posted them on the wall in the gallery so people can read those when they yeah. come to um, see the show in person. Um, another uh, question um, is, do you have similar processes of using clay versus painting? Mm -hmm. um hmm. well in term hmm. well the paintings are the paintings are oil and cold wax and I do use on the paintings also gold leaf and also I in some of them I incorporated broken mirror which are in the Sephora pieces so in that way there's there's a continuum in terms of the process, yeah, I think that it, it um, I do a lot, of, well, hmm, it's hard to describe, but with the clay, I start with kind of a column, and I build around the column, and build out from the column, push in from the column, that's what I do with the clay, and I probably change things a zillion times, but I don't realize it so much, because it's all being built around this column, whereas with painting, I don't do that, I don't start with the columnar form, and build out with the painting I just start you know doing some kind of swishy painting and some drawing or something with oils but then the wiping out happens all the time <laughs> and I'm very conscious of when I like completely just um, take off the oil and cold wax and then because it's oil and cold wax and it leaves a, a residue to it it leads to other things and it's very intuitive and I love that aspect of it. So I return to what I'm painting from, which is usually one of my sculptures, but then I play with the materials and I'd say that's the same. That part's the same. So it's the same and different. Okay. Um, so I have uh, more questions here. How did the creative process differ between your Sephora and your Frida Kahlo series? And mm. how were they similar? Wow, good questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, um, the Sephora series, it took me a while to figure out what I was going to do because I, I had started the Sephora series and I knew, I knew that they were about 
bird and flight and freedom and travel. That's what it was pre-COVID. And then they changed with COVID. And with COVID, the first, and I was still working on this series for a show. And so I started to make more pieces and they were dark and ugly. And I guess they were like how I was feeling and how the world was feeling about this pandemic invading us. And I didn't want to put that out into the world. Like I didn't think we needed more of what's horrible. So that series changed and I wanted to have a vision that was about rebirth and beauty and taking this time as of nesting this time of we're at home we're nesting like a bird you know we're taking care of our family we are taking care of ourselves trying to remain healthy and and what's a vision of beauty and and the vision of beauty that i came up with was was pregnancy so that's that series and then what kind of surfaces would suit those two parts of sephora this series for Frida, I knew that I, it, it's part of the, um, it, it's part, <laughs> what's that? What? Did you hear that? No. So, I, do you hear, do you hear me? I hear you. Yeah. yeah. Siri is on and it's telling me, I didn't get that. Can you please repeat it? There's nothing to read on my screen. Oh, really? Not <laughs> on mine and not on oh, the well, Facebook good. Live. <laughs> That's good to know. So I'm so I'm gonna just keep on talking and ignore uh, that that person. <laughs> you, yes, yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> That's so weird. So um Frida is part of a different series. Frida is part of Ladies Not Waiting and its historical figures. And it's a reinterpretation of that and my take on that. And so I knew that I was working I I knew that I'm inspired by Frida um, and have been since, um, oh God, since I was in art school and we went to Mexico. I knew I was inspired by her because of her life and her resilience and, and her story and her artwork and her home and her beauty and all of those things put together. So Frida, I worked from, um, I worked from her paintings and, and then played around with the symbolism in those paintings and other things came into it. In both cases, I'm working from something. Like I was either working from my sculptures or I'm working from the paintings. Okay, um, Jillian has said, uh, she does, she says, I do like you rec you're recognizing your mentors and I respect the journaling. It must help you to understand and describe your pieces. And yes. then she asks if the show has an affected your arts umbrella teaching. Mm, that's a good question. Um, hmm. Well, I wonder if my students are listening because that was their homework. Um, <laughs> actually, I think that last fall I, in arts umbrella, I had the kids do Frida. And I was I was um, having them do heads of Frida Kahlo, but also looking at um, ancient Egypt and Cleopatra, and having that kind of be morphed together in some way. And it also, to me, related to Las Meninas and the hair of Las Meninas, right? right. So um, that sort of influenced my even choosing to do Frida for okay. for this show. Okay. Um, yeah, the teaching, we are working with heads, we're working with hands, we're working with the motion, we're working with, uh, but they're not doing Frida's by any stretch. They're all doing their own thing. It's very exciting what they're doing. Yeah, they're personal to them. Well, that, and that's always helpful when they're creating and yeah. learning to create. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, now, this question is uh, says if uh, as a woman as a woman artist making sculptures of primarily female figures, are there any pre-established concepts of the female form in art that you are trying to disrupt or modify? Hmm, that's a good question too. Well. I don't think my pieces, I think they're sexy in terms of being alive, but I don't think that they're about staring at someone's breasts. 
you know they're not they're not about um they're not about sex some you know they're not about a man looking at a woman they're not about that they're not about um you know a, a fabulously creative famous artist seducing his model who he's who he's painting you know i mean even you know, I, my spirit mentor Picasso is famous for that. I don't admire that aspect of him, or a lot of a lot of those paint uh, those painters. Although I think their paintings are incredible, so um, I don't know that I consciously consciously do that. I think that my work has to do with with actually who is being painted, whoever I'm choosing. I'm thinking about it from who they are and how I respond to them what aspects of them I respond to. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, how does your decision of using ceramics as your medium coincide with your practices, your art practices, ideas of resilience, resourcefulness, and beauty? <laughs> That's so interesting. Well, you have to have all of that, I guess, to work with clay because it, it takes a lot of resilience to get through the times when things might be blowing up and cracking. Yeah. Um, it does create a lot of beauty. Uh, you do have to be really resourceful because clay does a lot of things that, you know, can drive you crazy in terms of, of slumping, in terms of um, drying too quickly, drying too slowly. It's breakable in the end, you know, like even if you've worked on it, you know, if you drop, I almost knocked over my wine glass, you know, that is ceramic, um, you know, you, you have to be very resourceful to figure out how to make it stand up, defy gravity. Yeah, it, it encompasses all those things, actually. I haven't thought about that, but it does. Yes. Um, what do you believe is the most important takeaway from your artwork? From my artwork. Well, uh, I, I, th I think the most important takeaway is to um, do what you love and be your most authentic self. And uh, in terms of, of how you live your life, to live your life that way with as much um, creativity and beauty and giving back to the world and appreciation and compassion and empathy as possible in whatever it is that you're doing that you and for me it's through making art and what I teach to children is through the actual process of making art but but they might not all be artists and not everybody is going to dedicate their life to being an artist but those other aspects that you learn and and um, you know dealing with disappointments and dealing with um, how you get past that and how you problem solve all those things, thinking outside the box, all those things. That's the takeaway. Okay. That's wonderful. Um, so what's next for your art practice? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I <Okay>. think, <laughs> I think <laughs> I, someone else asked me that, you know, I'm, I've been so involved with this show and with teaching. Um, today I was in, in working with the children. I, um, I have them making, so here's where the kids work. What I'm doing with kids influences my work. I made a piece today for the first time that I like the back better than the front. That never happens. And I incorporated into the heads that they're doing hands and the hands could be made in all different ways and be doing all different things. And the piece that I made has a lot of hands and it has a face, but it also has these, um, I had made these, uh, little molds of all of my Sephora faces. I, had, I made them in clay and then I made clay piece masks that fit inside those molds. And they can be made very, very quickly. And they're of all my Sephora faces. They're all those different faces. And I use them for tests. So I would know how I wanted to paint or glaze those pieces, which I never do. But I, I did it for that. And I brought those in to show it to the kids. And then I started making those masks and, and assembling them sort of in a weird totemic way and in relation to the hands and in relation to the face on the front. And that might be somewhere that I'm going that I don't know anything about. Well, there you go. Now <laughs> you've started to think about it. What happens next? Um, thank you very much for being here this evening, Susie. Um, I uh, am so appreciative 
that you were able to do this virtual event with us. And um, I look forward to seeing you on your next visit to the gallery. Yes, uh, did I you, be <laughs> Did you want to say anything to your to the viewers or people to watch the video in the future? Yes, I just want to say thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your great questions. Thank you for, you know, watching a 27 minute video in your time or almost, you know, and um, and yeah, I hope you show it to people. I hope you share it with people. It will be on YouTube and uh, the full one will be on YouTube. And um, I just want to say thank you and come see the show and please write me and tell me what you think about the work and um, and go out and see art and buy art. Don't forget that. But, you know, do that a lot. Yeah. You can actually um, connect with Susie through uh, her artist profile on, um, on Pomo Art's website. Uh, you'll be able to contact Susie. And there's a digital gallery on the exhibition page that you can scroll through the artwork if you aren't able to get in and see it in person, which it is definitely worth coming in to see this show. Mm -hmm. Thank, you Thank you very much to everyone who came, uh, was able to come here tonight on this lovely summer evening, the uh, hot uh, heat wave going on. So I appreciate <laughs> you spending your time with us. Susie, hang on for a sec. I'm just going to end the uh, Facebook Live and I'll uh, ask you a couple of questions after. <laughs> okay. Okay. So thank you very much, everyone. And we will see you in the gallery. Good night. Good night.